Father, bless us on this Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate what you did some 2,000, 1,800 years ago and what you, you've done in our lives and how you've saved us and given us a mind to come and to worship and to serve you. I pray that you would anoint us today with the anointing of a servant to do the will of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Servant. Or oh, we could go servanthood, right? Um, let's take a look at our text and, and, and see what, what Jude is saying here. And, and, and so today, I guess, for this message, this part of the message, I'll start with the author. Jude. Everybody say Jude. Jude. Jude here identifies himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. You see that? The servant of Jesus Christ and he also calls himself the brother of James. Servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Before we talk about servant of Jesus Christ, let's take a look at brother of James. All right? Are you praying for me? This James is not James, the brother of John. James and John will call the sons of thunder. For James, the brother of John, James, the apostle, the brother of John, was dead by the time Jude wrote this letter. You remember James' mother, who said to Jesus, I have a request. Allow my boys to sit one on your right hand and one on your left when you enter into your kingdom. The Lord says, that's, that's not for me to give. He says, but I got a question for you. Are your kids able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink from and be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with? And she said, yes, not knowing what she was saying. And her son, James, was the first of the original 12 apostles to be martyred, Herod killed him, for Christ. So this is not James, the apostle, but this is James, who wrote the book that bears his name of James. Later called um, James the Just. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 verse 19 clearly identifies James. Paul calls him the Lord's brother. If you read Galatians 1 and 19, you see that he actually said that. This is James when he went to Jerusalem to see uh, the apostles, he says that he, he saw very few of them, but among the ones he did see was he saw James, the Lord's brother. James was also the leader at the, of the church at Jerusalem. It's interesting. He never became an apostle, but he did become the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And as you study, you do see the Bible wholeheartedly endorses organized religion. You can't read and study James and the apostles and, and Jude and the writings and not see an organized structure, a, a structure of authority. James was not a, a disciple, an apostle, this James, but he had authority in the church. So much authority that when the apostle Peter 
was delivered from prison. And the Lord brought him out and broke the chains and set him free. The Bible teaches that uh, the, the Lord said to him, according to Acts 12 and 17, go show these things to James and to the brethren. Let James know that I have set you free. Praise the Lord. Acts verse 15 and 13 says, and after they had held their peace, this is when Paul had went to uh, Jerusalem. That was a doctrinal dispute, organized religion. They went to Jerusalem to get the doctrinal dispute settled. The dispute was there were Judaizers who taught that in order to be saved, you also had to be circumcised. Acts 15. When Paul heard them add something to salvation other than the cross, Paul disputed with them vehemently. And uh, he wouldn't even let them finish their sentence. I mean, it was a real argument there at the church. And so since they couldn't settle it, they went to Jerusalem headquarters. They went to the headquarters church and they made their argument before James. And after they had argued and held their peace, Acts 15 and 13, James answered, the Bible says, saying. So James was the ruling elder. To use Church of God in Christ language, he was the presiding bishop. Organized. That's not what I'm preaching about, but I can't ignore it. Praise the Lord. And in, and in verse 19 of Acts 15, James, Acts 15, the 19th verse says, and James said this, my sentence is. So much for people who says, I don't want to hear from anybody but Jesus. Can't nobody tell me anything but the Lord. I'll go to the Lord and I'll pray, and only the Lord will instruct me. Well, James says, my sentence. My decision is, and when James rendered his decision, everybody abided by James' decision, even the mighty apostle Paul. James was a leader in the church. Are you with me? With Jude being James' brother, that means something else interesting about Jude, that Jude dared not mention. If Jude was James' brother and the apostle in Galatians 1 and 19 recognized James as the Lord's brother or half-brother, then that means both Jude and James were half-brothers of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 13 and 55, uh, they questioned Jesus. They says, is this not, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this his mother called Mary and his brethren or his brothers, James, Jose, Simon, and Judas? Judas here, of course, not being Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, but Judas Jude, James' brother, Mary and Joseph's son, who grew up in the household with Jesus Christ. Jesus being their literal older brother. Bible says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, is not this the carpenter who's the son of Mary? talking about Jesus, the brother of James and Josie and, and of Judah and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. Jesus had sisters. So we see his family. Now, a sad note is that they didn't believe on the Lord Jesus 
during their earthly ministry. I guess, I guess it is true that familiarity can breed contempt. How can you grow up with Jesus? Sleep in the same house with Jesus. They weren't millionaires. They were, they, he was a carpenter. His dad Joseph was a carpenter. Hard working family. Uh, I'm sure they shared bedrooms. And uh, to grow up with Jesus uh, as your older brother. And, uh, and you don't believe on him. Bible says in John 7 and 5. For neither did his brothers believe in him. How'd you go to school with him and not believe on him? How'd you watch him become a teenager and grow up and not believe on him? How did you, how did you watch him through his 20s? Because now he, 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 he lived a sinless life, so we know it couldn't, it couldn't be that Jesus hadn't got saved yet. Couldn't have been that. Because that would have disqualified him. For him to qualify to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He had to live a sinless life. And yet be tempted to the degree that most humans, that I would say all humans, have never been tempted. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points. That is, in every temptation that Satan threw out to him, he was tempted. Satan had to use every trick to the nth degree because Jesus failed for none of them. Now, none of us have been tempted to that degree because we give in long before. Long before it gets to that degree. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself long before nth degree. Are you with me today? Maybe, maybe it's still a little too early for some of you to say amen. Or could it be the subject matter? But none of his brothers received him. And then after he started his ministry, at the age of 30, and for three years, healed the sick, raised the dead, walked on water, turned water into wine, fed 5,000 with two little fish, five barley loaves, fed 4,000 with two little fish, five barley loaves, did all kinds of things, caused withered hands to be made straight, blind eyes to come open, did all these things, and not one of his brothers. I don't see where it's recorded in, in biblical history at all that his sisters ever got saved. Notice, we don't hear from them. I'll show you in a minute where after his resurrection, uh, you do find him, that his brothers, you do find them in the upper room with his mother praying. Which would imply if they were there on that day, somebody got saved. Because everybody in the upper room on the day of Pentecost was saved. So be careful that you not get so familiar that you fail to appreciate what the Lord is doing in your life. Some of us have become professional churchgoers. We're not moved anymore. Someone get say the Lord healed me from cancer. Praise him. The Lord saved my soul. It's a yarn. We feel like we've seen it all. That's a trick of Satan. That's a trick of Satan. You better, you better know how to stay excited about what the Lord is doing. Amen. Be, be grateful when the Lord let you live to see another day. Be grateful. Be appreciative. Notice his goodness when he provides food to eat and a shelter over your head. And when the Lord, it doesn't matter what you're riding down the road in, thank God for the vehicle. Amen. And Because one time you didn't have that. You had to depend on public transportation. And then if you're there, thank God for that. 
Wherever you are, there are reasons to praise the Lord and you have to watch Satan because the devil will cause you to be, he'll blind you and cause you not to see the evidence of God and the move of Christ and, and the glory of Jesus that is taking place in your life right before your eyes. Paul said to the saints at Galatia, I'm surprised at how soon you were shaken. How, how little it took to move you from, your, from what I've taught you before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth. I'm moved by how some of the uh, people will grow up in the church and leave Jesus and become a five percenter. Leave Jesus and join a woke movement. Leave Jesus and get into this kinetic garbage. Leave Jesus and you've seen the glory of God. You, you grew up in the glory and go to college and hear some, some professor uh, throw out stuff that you haven't heard before and you buy that junk and you came up looking at Jesus and the power of Christ. I don't, I, I've, I've searched, I've searched, I don't have enough, I, I, can't, I can't understand how they couldn't, uh, especially once he started his ministry. Now maybe when he was a little boy, maybe they grew envious of him because he always got it right. Maybe that was a sibling rivalry, they were upset. Mama, mama treats you different from the way she treats the rest of us. They did hear the rumors. You know, as they got older, they heard the rumors. They heard, you know, you know, you know how old his brother, you know, you know his dad was not Joseph. You, you know he, he's, he's, he's illegitimate. Mom cheated. That's the word that's out. And, and you know, when, when she talks about it, she said God did it. Yeah, so so they, when they looked at him, they... They, 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 they looked at him and they saw him uh, as different for, uh, for more reasons than one. And, you know, that, that was the talk. This is that he is illegitimate. He's uh, Mary's bastard son. Yeah, so maybe, maybe that was the problem. But the good news is, the good news is after the resurrection, some of his family members, his brothers, got saved. They, they saw the light. How many can say, preacher, I saw the light? They, they, they saw the light. According to Acts 1 and 14, it says, all these continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all, all, and uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they were in the upper room. And then Paul gives a special shout out to James the just. For by the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, James the apostle was long dead. Paul writes and says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 7, that speaking of all of the eyewitnesses that saw Jesus, says, and after that he was seen of James. Jesus appeared to his brother James, and then all of the apostles. What's interesting is that when you study the book of James and you study the book of Jude, neither James nor Jude ever call themselves the brothers or the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. What a privilege you know, had that been us, <laughs> you know I'm the Lord's brother, don't you? You know I'm the Lord's brother. Give me that seat. I'm the Lord's brother. Get out, uh, give, me that, give me my pocket space. I'm the Lord's brother. I want to lead every song. I'm the Lord's brother. I'm preaching this Sunday because I'm the Lord's brother. I'm the Lord's brother. I'm the Lord's brother. I should be fed. Why am I at the back of the line waiting to get fed? I should be at the front of the line. I'm the Lord's brother. Neither man called themselves the Lord's brother. If you read James chapter 1, verse 1, the A clause says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, our text, Jude, verse 1, Jude, 
the servant of Jesus Christ. Servant. Everybody say servant. servant. I'm almost finished. Servant here. Dolos is the uh, Greek word. It means slave. Slave. You know, the word slave it plays a special role with black folk. We don't like uh, being a slave. You bring up slave or slavery or you just say the S-L. <laughs> Make the sound and it almost uh, kills our spirit. The word here, slave, the dolos, is one who is in a permanent relationship of servitude to another. Permanent relationship of servitude to another. Jude uses this word to describe his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The slave loses his will. The goal, his goal in life. Whatever it is, he wants to grow up to become. All of that is lost uh, in the life of the dolos. The dolos lives to do his master's will. The dolos knows that he may never grow up to be the master of the plantation. That's not a lie. Praise the Lord. Or whatever it is that the Dolos wanted to be, once he has entered into this relationship of servitude, of slavery, from that point on, his life is consumed with obeying the will of his master. Matthew 8 and 9 says, man said this, he says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. I wonder today how many of us are true servants. What do we say to the Lord when the Lord says, go? Do we go, or do we say to him, go yourself? Or do we say to him, I'm not led to go? Do we say to him, I don't feel like going? I want to know how many servants do we have in here? For the servant lives to do the will of his master. Can I get a witness? Matthew 20 and uh, the 27 says, and, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. I want to say to all of us who possess lofty titles and positions, good God Almighty, don't assume that the title puts you in a place to be served, but actually it is to make you a servant. Oh, we all wait to see if our names are going to be called. This is not the mindset of a servant. Praise the Lord. We all are particular about the way we are or are not recognized, acknowledged, or treated. This is not the mindset of uh, the servant. The servant is concerned with doing the will of the master. And the higher God raises you up, the, the more humble the servant is to become. You don't be, get a position and then get highfalutin. You don't get a position in God and then all of a sudden a uh, spirit of arrogance uh, manifests and you behave as though you're superior to those who do not have uh, that uh, title or that position. Instead, it ought to humble you. Instead, it ought to cause us to say, you know what? I think I'm going to attend church more. I think I'm going to work harder. Praise the Lord. If God elevates you, we're elevated not to be served. Jesus said that's the way it is in the world of the Gentiles. Said, but in the kingdom, th those of us who is the greatest among you, let him be your servant. Oh my, it's quiet in here. Praise the Lord, but you know that I'm telling you the truth. I'm not with the churches that have gone Hollywood. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, Facebook didn't mess us up. Everybody wants to be a star. Praise the Lord. And we, we use the space to take 10,000 pictures of ourselves 
every pose imaginable. I'm not talking about X-rated or obscene, but we have become in many cases, I can't get a witness, obsessed with our own appearance, in love with ourselves, and have lost the meaning of what it is to be a servant. Oh, it's hard to find folk who will man the cameras, work on the sound, clean up the restrooms, drive the vans, you know, those non-glory jobs. But the jobs that are most important. The, I liken some of the jobs in the church like the bicep muscle. The bicep muscle is called the show muscle. It's always impressive to see a man with nice, bulging biceps. And, and it looks nice as long as you don't go too far on ladies who have nice guns. Nice bicep. But for people who understand the human anatomy, the bicep does very little other than lift the arm. That's it. The power comes for that tricep. Pushing power, your punching power. You got to have developed strong triceps and shoulders and legs. That bicep is a show muscle. Some of us love show positions. Look good. Look like you're doing something wonderful. You'll fight to read a scripture, but you'll also fight not to pick up paper. Oh my, when one is a servant, the servant is not concerned about the limelight. The servant is concerned about the will of God. When you come out of the presence of God and you see yourself with the worldwide ministry, and you see yourself above others, and you see everybody looking your way, my advice is go back into his presence. Spend a little more time in there because when Isaiah left the presence of God, Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone. See, the presence of God humbles you. The promotion of God makes you go back and pray again. Because you, you, hallelujah, you stagger at what God has given you to do. And you can tell when the Lord has given you an assignment because the assignment is always just beyond your grasp. Praise the Lord. You don't have the money that you need. You don't have the help that you need. He, he gives you an assignment and then he gives it to you in a way where you just got to rely on him. And he does this so that we will stay humble and serve him like the Bible said. And then I heard him ask the question, since y'all don't want to hear me preach, said, who then is that faithful and wise servant who his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Who is that faithful servant whom God hath given authority? Who is the servant? who is busy doing what the Lord have given us to do. Too many of us are sitting around doing nothing. You're not thinking like a servant. I understand when you first get saved, you might need a little time to familiarize yourself with the church, but there are too many agencies, too many folk who need to be fed, too many people at the, uh, uh, at the rest homes, too many sinners in the street, too many women having abortions, too many things going on for you to still be sitting there saying the Lord hadn't led me to join anything yet. When you get the mind of a servant, the servant quickly goes to work because the Lord have saved us to serve. And when you begin to serve, it takes your mind off yourself. Nothing causes you to forget your own problems like serving to help someone else. The Bible said, look not every man on his own things, but look every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He'll make you a servant. He'll put you to work. Somebody ought to lift their hands and say, Lord, anoint me to be a servant. Not only, Jude was not only a slave, but he was a bond slave. Dolos is not just slave, 
but his bond slave. That is the lowest rank. Servant, the low, you, you, you're the slave on the bottom of the totem pole. Can I get a witness? And the bond slave uh, would serve his master all the days of his life. And not only was you the slave, good God Almighty, and you know the Bible teaches that when we humble ourselves, the Lord will exalt us. James says he giveth more grace, hallelujah, but he giveth more grace to the humble. Thank you, Jesus. Wherefore, uh, he said, God resisteth the pride, but he giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Look at, look at this. Uh, it says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. That is, straighten up your conduct and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That is, let the Lord clean up your inward life. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Pray that God set you free and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You don't have to lift up yourself. Just humble yourself. You don't have to blow your own horn. Just humble yourself. He'll set you on high if you will humble yourself. One last thing I want to observe. Uh, Butler says this about Jude. He said there are three significant things. I'll deal with one or two of the three. For one of them I've already dealt with. One of the things was the name Jude itself. Look at this man's attempt to humble himself. The name Jude is a shortened form or it is a nickname for the name Judas. So when Jude even writes the letter, I know how we would have signed it. We would have put all of our positions on it. But Jude said, no, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna put my whole name on it. He says, but I'll use a short form of my name. Uh, Judas is the actual name and Judas was a very common name in Israel. It is related to the name Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, after whom the tribe of Judah was named and then Jesus Christ was born of the tribe of Judah. And the southern kingdom was called Judah. We get the name Jews from the name Judah. So Jude, not wanting to exalt himself at all, signed the letter using a nickname. Instead of calling himself Judas, the, 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 the brother of Jesus, he called himself Jude, the brother of James. Now, the brother of James is a wonderful title, but you have to admit, it's not as prestigious as the brother of Jesus. What was the point? He was trying to make sure that people looked upon him and saw him as Jesus' servant, but not him as Lord. And he wanted to make sure the people did not consider him to be some sort of Messiah. But he wanted to point people where they needed to be pointed, and that was to the cross. So he said, yes, I'm James' brother, but the more prestigious designation, the one that I could really grab hold to, being the brother of Christ, I'll let that go because he's not my elder brother. He's my Lord and Savior, and I am his servant. I want to tell you today, we're not called to tell Jesus what to do. We're not called to walk side by side with Christ. We're not called to lead Christ, but we're saved to serve Jesus. So when the Lord is allowing you to go through, don't get bitter because when slaves go through, slaves understand that their master is leading them a certain kind of way. When you understand your relationship, then you can trust what the Lord is allowing. You can trust him as he takes you through the deep and the harsh 
parts of life and you say, God, why did this happen? And God, why'd you let that happen? He'll come back and tell you, I am your master and my glory will be brought out of this. Somebody said, Lord, who did sin that this man was born blind? His father, his mother, his father, or himself. Jesus said, none of those sin, but this thing was done for the glory of God, that the glory of God might be revealed in him. I wonder, is there anybody here who wants the glory of God revealed in their life more than you want to reach your goals, more than you want to live up to your potential, more than you want to be whatever it is that you want to be. Are you here to say to the Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I had the psalmist say, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Lift your hands and tell him, Lord, I glory in being your servant. Lord, I glory in being your slave. Now, somebody lift your voice and just crowd. He knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for me. And I'm going to serve him. I'm his servant. Yeah. Somebody lift your hands and glorify the Lord. I want you to do this. I want you. I want you, before we have communion, to look at the person next to you based on this message that I just preached. And I want you now to introduce yourself to that individual. My name is Pat. I'm the servant of Jesus Christ. Somebody say yeah. We glory. We glory. We glory. We glory in being the Lord's servants. Father, we denounce our pride. Father, in this day of self-awareness, in this day of self-help, in this day of life coaches and gurus who basically tell us everything we want to hear, write volumes on building ourselves in our own eyes. We stand on this Resurrection Sunday to say what you said. You said this. He that will lose his life for my sake will find it. You said that if we lose our sense of identity in you, then you will show us who we really are. You didn't tell us to Trust Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, or any of that brand. You say, whosoever will lose himself in me will find himself. So Lord, all of this self-help, all of this conditioning that has built us up and made us into the selfish, self-driven self-absorbed, self-obsessed monsters that we've become. We repent of it. 
<sighs> we empty ourselves of all that. Oh God, we're 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 we're, we're too entitled to be good servants. We all feel, all of us feel that we don't get the recognize the acknowledgement, the recognition, all that stuff that we deserve. And, and the truth is, what we truly deserve is to be lost. Give us the mind of the dolos. That our greatest joy, our greatest sense of pride and achievement, that it comes from knowing that we've pleased our master. Lord, we want to hear you say, well done. Judas would not even call himself by his surname. His given name when he wrote the book. But he used a nickname. And he wouldn't dare. If we had to learn from his book that he was your half-brother, we would have never known. But what we do know is that he was your servant. Oh, God, anoint us. Anoint us with the spirit of servitude. Give us to find joy and prestige and honor in being called your servants. Let the first thing that come out of our mouth when people meet us be that we are the Lord's servant we can give name rank serial number address and all that occupation and all that but let the first thing be servant we serve the Lord's church we serve at the Lord's pleasure we serve to bring glory to him Forgive us of pride. Forgive us, oh God, for this self-awareness on steroids that have almost destroyed us, made us unfit husbands, unfit wives, unfit friends, unfit, unfit, because everything, everything we measure every relationship. We measure every encounter based on how it affects us as individuals and not us as your servants. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us today. Forgive us, forgive us. Truth is, Lord, these things have gone to our heads and made us in many cases too big for our britches. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves to being the Lord's servants. 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 You died to make us servants. You rose again to we will not adjust to the world to gain their acceptance at the expense of our servitude to Jesus Christ. We will not adjust to friends and family. We will not adjust even to spouses at the expense of our servitude. God, touch every husband and let each husband understand he's not the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, of his household. Jesus is Lord of the household. Husbands, if we're going to be lords of our household, then Jesus won't be. And let's see how far we get with that. Wives, you're not the Lord's 
pastors, we're not, the, the Bible is clear on this. Be not lords over God's heritage. But we are to be examples to the flock. Forgive us, Lord. We humble ourselves today. We do like James. We do like Jude. We grab hold to the most prestigious designation that there is. We are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift your hands and worship right now.